child allegedly at the hands of 37-year-old Gregory Scott Hale. Just creepy. It makes me wonder, all those people that were liking his post, all those people that were making comments on his page, nobody had the guts to say, but man, are you really serious about this? Yeah. This is the story of Gregory Hale and the murder of Lisa Hyder. Later, I will get into the story of Jean of Elg. Both of these stories involve Satanists who consumed parts of their victims. The questions remain, did Gregory act on his religious beliefs or was he just a fraud? This isn't a story of delusional religiosity. To me, this is a story of reverence. Let's get into it. So if you end up liking this video, please subscribe. Also, just so I can get to know you guys better, follow my personal Instagram, link is in the description. Richard Ramirez, who you may know as the Night Stalker, rose to infamy after his murderous spree in California in 1989. For one long year, Ramirez stalked the streets of Los Angeles where he found his way into homes and sexually assaulted the woman in the home before often murdering other people in the home and taking whatever valuables caught his eye. After his arrest, Ramirez was convicted of 13 murders, 5 attempted murders and 11 sexual assaults. The night nice stalker was nothing short of barbaric, but despite how heinous his actions were, Ramirez was actually revered in some small circles. One such person was Gregory Scott Hale a man who idolized Ramirez and had every intention of becoming his own night stalker. Gregory Scott Hale looked and behaved exactly as you would expect a night stalker fan to behave. A self-proclaimed Satanist whose interests included weapons, venomous snakes and cannibalism and his favorite band was the heavy metal band Slayer. He wasn't shy about any of this either. Hale shared his views proudly on his Facebook page and blog where he posted pictures of himself in bizarre outfits along with comments like Would that vegetarian taste like that fake soy meat like they got in some fast food places? He would also say I hug the people I hate so I know how big to dig their hole in my backyard. Mate, creepy guy, huh? Hale allegedly obsessively combed through Ramirez's manifesto. When he learned of Ramirez's passing on June the 7th, 2013, who died of complications from B-cell lymphoma while on death row, Hale posted a comment that read, RIP Night Stalker, wish I could have met you. It likely wasn't a coincidence that exactly one year and one day after Ramirez's death, Hale would fulfill his greatest desire, a horrific crime that would have made his idol proud. Gregory had previously worked at a slaughterhouse until he was fired after his boss discovered he had been taking animal bones, animal blood and even eyeballs back to his house, allegedly to perform satanic rituals. Losing his job meant that Hale had to move back in with his parents. This home was on Pete Sane Road in rural Tennessee. It is unclear exactly how Gregory's parents were of his extreme behaviour. His neighbours knew about Hale and his antics, enough to reportedly think of him as sick and a devil worshipper. That being said, few actually thought he was dangerous. But before I get into the victim and the crime itself, Let's have a look at these satanic rituals that Gregory would partake in. When I read Gregory would take bones and blood to perform rituals, it led me to Palo Mayumb. Palo Mayumb is a form of magic originating from Africa. Firstly, you have a pot. It's known 
as a ganger. You place the items inside, the blood and the bones etc. This helps summon the spirit who can do the bidding of the person committing the magic. Now it's important to understand that Palo Mayumbe specifically is normally done with human remains. Someone will sacrifice another human and then use their body parts to engage in this magic. I'm telling you this because it's unclear exactly what type of magic he partook in. We can extend this further. If we look at Levian Satanism, found by Anton Sandor Levey, he didn't believe in a material physical devil. To him, Satan was a symbol. Satan was a representation of pride, carnality, the bestial aspects of man. Within Levey's Satanism, he had what's known as greater and lesser magic. As it is written in the Satanic Bible, magic is the change in situations or events in accordance with one's will, which would, using normally accepted methods, be unchangeable. From a Satanic standpoint, magic is divided into two categories. You have greater magic, which is more ritual and ceremonial, and lesser magic, which is more manipulative. Greater magic is about gathering your positive or negative energy and directing it towards a specific goal through either ceremony or ritual. In ritual, the Satanist places the desired goal into his subconscious mind where it can be freed of distraction. By doing so, it becomes more instinctual to work towards achieving that goal. In ceremony, the Satanist casts out his positive energy in celebration of a specific event. In other words, the Satanist may want to get the job that he really wants or he may want to pass his exams, whatever it may be. Like any religious person that may go to the church or the mosque and ask God for, you know, uh, help or whatever. This is what someone who follows a Satanist religion would do. Lesser magic is about using little known techniques that makes it possible for the Satanist to gain the upper hand in certain situations, manipulating circumstances in accordance with one's will. Some of those techniques might include wordplay or the command to look, also known as distraction. But let me go into more detail regarding this. We are literally talking about trying to summon a demon. You see, I'm a Muslim myself and we have a detailed view of black magic. You may not believe in any of this stuff, that's okay. I'm just trying to give you a context on what was going through Gregory's mind. He wasn't a Muslim, I know, but I'm just going to give you more detail. Now, spirits, ghosts and demons in the Islamic faith, whatever you want to call them, fall into the category of the unseen. We believe the demons can travel at the speed of light and shapeshift. Again, you may not believe any of this, but I'm trying to help you understand the different types of magic. To summon said demons, one needs to engage in numerology or again sacrifice animal's head, call the demon and then hope the demon accepts the human's plea. It could be any kind of animal sacrifice, it could be like this animal's neck, hands or whatever, it could even be human remains. So the question remains, why would a human do this? Well, it's all for desire. The only reason someone would summon a demon is so they can get something they want. It could be asking the demon to go spy on someone. It could be asking the demon to go make someone ill or sick. The intent, of course, is something sinister. But there's also another question. Why would a demon listen to you? What does the demon want? Well, it wants obedience. The demon wants human beings to bow down to it. If Gregory was in contact with a demon, the demon may have said, okay, I will do X, Y, Z for you, but for me, go sacrifice a human. You understand what I mean? Gregory will do whatever the demon would want, so long as the demon could do whatever Gregory would want. That's the transaction here. But who is in control? For me, it's the demon. Because you can never control something you can't see. Lisa Marie Hyder grew up in the Columbus area and attended Groveport Madison High School before moving to Watkins Memorial High School in Pataskala, where she graduated in 1996. Lisa battled with alcoholism from a young age, a battle that was exasperated after she was given a grim diagnosis in 2014. Doctors found out that the 36-year-old had ovarian cancer and leukemia. She was given just six months to live. She figured drinking was going to help her hurry and die. Her ex-husband said that they gave her six months to live 
and she wanted to make it faster. Her cousin described Lisa as a lost soul who had a rocky life. That ex-husband was Charles Hyder. He and Lisa had two children together which added to the four children she had previously with different partners. But despite her divorce with Charles, the pair remained amicable. They had separated sometime in early 2014 after Charles could no longer handle Lisa's alcoholism and her not wanting to get any help. Before staying with friends in Manchester, which is near Coffey County, Lisa had shared a home in Chattanooga with Charles and the six children. In May 2014, Lisa's father, Bill Poor, had moved to Tennessee to be closer to his daughter. But he didn't go there to help her with her substance abuse issues, he went there out of his own intuition. Her father said, something told me to come back down here and on one night, he woke up in a muck sweat after having a nightmare of something awful happening to his daughter. Eerily, this is exactly what was on the horizon. Lisa had been staying with friends in Manchester and working at a local liquor store when she ran into Gregory Hale. It's a day her ex-husband will never forget. It was June the 8th, 2014. Lisa, she gives Charles a call. She asks him, hey, can you pick me up from work? At the time, he wasn't close by, but he told her he would call her when he was on his way. When Charles made that call, it went unanswered. He did not know at the time, but tragically, Lisa had just hours to live. While she stood outside on the corner, Hale pulled up to buy some beer. It was on his way out of the store that he spotted Lisa and went over to talk to her. Presumably, it came up in conversation that she was waiting for a ride home which is why Hale then offered to drive her back. Lisa didn't accept right away. She was quite hesitant to get into a stranger's car. Hale was able to convince her though and at that stage Lisa was tired of waiting for Charles. Lisa got into Hale's car and gave him directions to her place. It wasn't long before she realized he wasn't following the directions and when she queried this, Hale explained that he needed to go back to his home First, you know, to go and pick up some items. When they pulled up to the home, Hale invited Lisa inside. She didn't want to go inside. She was worried. She was like, I don't know this guy. But then he offered her a beer and this she couldn't resist. The plan was for the two to have a few drinks before Hale dropped Lisa back home. That's what Lisa believed anyway. Hale then got the fireplace going and the two sat down next to each other. That to me is a weird one because this happened in June. Why is there a fireplace on in June? He poured Lisa a drink and they began to talk about their lives. Hale made Lisa feel comfortable. One thing led to another and Hale leaned in and kissed her. After sharing a long kiss, Hale suggested they move things to his bed. After having sex, they were both lying together and Lisa had fallen asleep. This is when Hale got out of the bed and his true plan was set in motion. He went to his closet and grabbed his machete. He then walked back to the bed and launched his violent attack on the unsuspecting Lisa, raising his arm in the air before swinging it down and striking Lisa in the stomach. The blade ripped into her. Lisa jolted. She woke up and she was screaming. Hale continued to strike her again and again. Her screams faded and her body became lifeless. Hale had accomplished his goal. He had emulated his hero the Night Stalker. During this time is when Charles was calling Lisa to let her know I'm on my way. But she wasn't picking up the phone so he assumed she found a ride home. Charles continued to call her but of course there was no answer. And then back at Hale's House of Horrors, he moved on to the next phase. Using his slaughterhouse experience, Hale dismembered and decapitated Lisa's body. He then placed her hands, her head, and her feet in a bucket and perhaps the most morbid disgusting weirdest aspect of this bizarre story is that it was at this point where Gregory began to consume part of Lisa's body and he did this to make sure he would not forget this moment. Hale also took photos of the buckets of remains with his phone. Unlike Richard Ramirez, Hale wouldn't go on to terrorize his town and multiple victims for months on end. He lacked the smarts and a fatal mistake made early on 
led to his arrest. Gregory decided to dispose of Lisa's body in his parents' backyard. I mean, how stupid do you want to be? There was a burn pit, which he thought would be perfect. For whatever reason, he then thought it would be better to bury the remains. How would he do that? Well, Hale went over to a neighbor and he asked to borrow a mechanical digger. Now, instead of coming up with another reason for needing the machine, Hale said to his neighbor, oh, I just need to go and bury a body. Bro, what are you doing? And that's when the neighbor got worried and called the authorities. And when the authorities arrived, a gruesome scene was lying in wait. Gregory was quickly arrested once the authorities got to him. Lisa's body was found by the burn pit, though it had not been set alight, along with the buckets of hand and feet and Lisa's head. Hale couldn't dream of denying he had murdered Lisa. When officers ventured into his bedroom, they found bedsheets drenched in blood and walls that were spattered with blood. After he was arrested, Gregory Hale was charged with first degree murder and abuse of a corpse. He then confessed to his crimes and he explained to the police in graphic detail how he murdered Lisa. And during the trial, he pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Now I want to go back to Reverence and Ramirez. Why did Gregory do this? Well, throughout history, we've all worshipped something. Some of us have sometimes worshipped idols. I think Gregory lacked an idolic, if that's even a word, figure in his life. Hero worship, looking up to someone for guidance. Ordinarily, this should be your father. I say that in the third person. For me, I'm a father. I want me to be my son's hero. When my son is in trouble, I want him to come to me. When my son wants to emulate someone else, I want him to emulate me. And I say that in a non-arrogant, respectful way. I just want to ensure that my child is raised the way I want him raised. But sometimes people look elsewhere to heroes because they lack that in their own family or anyone that they know quite well. Therefore, Gregory, he idolized Ramirez. He loved Ramirez. He consumed all his materials to the point where he wanted to be Ramirez because he had no backbone. He had no personality himself. He had no guidance. In other words, he began to worship Ramirez. Reverence is an instinct that's inside of us. Throughout the course of human history, we've all worshipped something. In the case of Gregory, Ramirez was his god. In fact, it may have even got to a point where whilst Gregory is reading Ramirez's manifesto, uh, looking at all the photos of him, obsessing over him, subconsciously he just became what Ramirez was. He became his message. He became the Night Stalker. Well, a discounted version anyway. But in reality, Gregory was a pussy. You want to know why? It's because he had some kind of internal void. And instead of approaching it and trying to figure it out, instead of taking the journey inward, he just escaped from it. And then he began to live his life through the vessel, through the eyes of someone else. And that's why I call him a pussy, because he couldn't face his own demons, whatever they were. And unfortunately, Lisa was the one that had to pay the price. And that's just so sad. She struggled with alcoholism, she had cancer, she had leukemia. I can only imagine what her family thought of her. Not real much information on any friends that she had. And then Gregory, such a sad life. I believe I'm speaking on behalf of all of you by saying, fuck Gregory Hale. Investigators are looking into a bizarre case of... A man is behind bars and a woman is dead in Coffee County. 37-year-old Gregory Scott Hale reportedly murdered the victim, identified as Lisa Marie Hyder, on Friday inside a home in Manchester. Lisa was a sweet girl. Very pretty girl. I can't believe anybody would want to do that to her. Cops were tipped off on June 6th when a neighbor called to report he had a reason to believe someone had been killed on his street. This home just outside of Manchester is where investigators say Lisa Marie Hyder was killed. A search warrant was obtained and sheriff's investigators arrived at the residence where they found Hale. He confessed to the killing. Hale told police he beheaded Hyder before cutting off her hands and feet. He then placed her extremities in buckets. He also confessed to eating a part of Hyder after murdering her. 
We called all weekend trying to get a hold of her because these kids talk to her every day. I'm lost. Uh, I can't sleep. I can't eat. I'm a nervous wreck. Hale lives with his parents, who were home at the time of the murder, but in a different section of the house. District Attorney Mickey Lane told reporters Hyder and Hale had only known each other for a short period of time. He said, I understand that they were recent acquaintances. My understanding is they just met that day. Hale has been charged with murder and abusing a corpse. We now move on to Jarno Sebastian Elg. This crime took place in the city of Hyvinka in Finland. On Tuesday, November 24th, 1998, a man dumping his trash noticed something in the garbage. When he was going through his garbage, he found a severed human leg. And then within the hour, police arrived at the scene. Forensics examined the leg and found that it was cut off at the thigh. They believed that it had been hacked by a large blade and they thought initially it was a man's leg given the type of hair on it. So the police decided to go and search the landfill where all the garbage is collected and they did so for about a month in very icy conditions. As details of the case unfolded in the investigation, police realized they were dealing with one of the most brutal incidents of bloodshed in all of Finland's history. Police worked their way through all trash taken to the landfill. Searchers were looking for the rest of the victim's remains in addition to any clue as to who killed him. A tractor spread out the trash and officers picked through it by hand, one bucket at a time, for weeks. While searching by hand, they also used cadaver dogs to help them search for any clues. But then they got a breakthrough. The police found more body parts. A stomach was found, because you know, that happens every day. And just so you know, the police to this day, have never released the name of the victim. In the end, they worked their way through more than 400 truckloads before suspending their search just before Christmas in 98. And besides the leg and stomach, no other parts were discovered. With no more clues as to the identity of the victim, the police appealed to the public for help. The only information was that someone aged between 20 and 60 years old, approximately 170 centimeters tall, had been murdered. Police asked that if anyone knew someone who had gone missing recently to inform law enforcement. Police then decided, okay, let's go back to our database. Let's see if there are, if there are any cases that were similar to this. And a case came up from back in 1993, where initially, at that time too, a severed leg was found. Unfortunately, that didn't bring back anything. But what gave the police further indication of what may have happened is when the forensics examined the stomach, it came with a large volume of alcohol. Therefore, the police concluded this could have been an alcoholic. Given the location he was at, perhaps he was young, maybe between 20 and 30 years old. And finally, when they went through their database looking for names that match this criteria per se, a lot of people came back who were poor and on welfare. So they went through their welfare database. Eventually, they found the match to a victim who was 23 years old. And again, as I mentioned, the name has not been released. His profile suggested he lived alone and didn't have much friends, hence why nobody reported him missing. Police tried to follow the victim's timeline, wondering where he was over that particular weekend. Now, the local church, they had a tea room, and they decided to organize an event. They wanted young teens who were addicted to alcohol to come, go to the church, have a friendly evening and try and give them some help if they wanted it. In this room entered Jarno Elg, Terry Tevashonka, Mika Riska and the victim. Now they went along because they wanted to challenge the members of the church on their beliefs. And the reason they wanted to do this is because Jarno himself was a Satanist. Jarno had been following this philosophy for years. Jarno believed individualism was the only true philosophy which to him is what Satanism is all about. Jarno did have a troubled upbringing and he suffered a lot of abuse from his family. He also had attempted suicide on many occasions and he was in therapy. At the time, Jarno was around 23-24 years old. Given his troubled teenage life, as Jarno got older, he became quite the cruel individual. In fact, there is one story where he taped his dog to the radiator, he then hit the dog with a pipe and allowed the heat from the radi radiator to burn the dog to death. He sat there and he watched it. And it's because Jarno did not believe in any moral limits, which is what to him Satanism was all about. If you feel something, act upon it without any regard of the consequences. Going back to November 21st, 1998, Terry Tevashonka was a friend of Jarno's 
and Jeannot became somewhat of a mentor for her. Both of them were very heavy drinkers and it was reported they had both been drinking since around the 9th grade. And now once investigators were able to identify the victim, police officers took to the streets of Hyvinka and questioned people, many of whom lived on the fringes of society. A couple of witnesses mentioned that the young man in question was in the company of Jarno and his friends on that particular weekend. The, some witnesses also said that the group also bragged about what they had done. They were proud of their achievement, feeling that they had committed the perfect murder. It did not take long before investigators connected the dots. So on the 8th of December 1998, police arrested the friends in connection with the murder. After his arrest, police searched Jarno's apartment. They discovered many items relating to satanic practices, the number 666, literature including the best chapter from the Book of Revelations, skull jewellery, knives. The subject matter of Jarno's belongings may have been indicative of the occult or of the dark arts. To the police, they sealed off Jarno's apartment and after a few weeks of DNA testing, forensic testing, they found the victim's DNA and blood all over the apartment. And it was during Jarno's interrogation where the police figured out what happened. Jarno and his friends, including the victim, were in the apartment. They were listening to music. Now, one particular song that they were listening to was talking about Cain and Abel, the brothers from the Bible story. Now, Cain ends up murdering Abel. And according to Jarno, Cain fulfilled his desire. Cain did what he wanted to do. Cain was disobedient to God. He acted without any moral limits. This was his interpretation of the story. The victim, however, while they were sitting and listening to their song, the victim had a different version of events. For some reason, Jarno did not like what the victim had to say, so he punched him and hit him repeatedly. The others then tied up the victim and had him crawling around like a dog for hours. As Jarno hit him more and more, eventually the victim blacked out and was left unconscious. They then picked up the victim, put the victim on the couch, and then applied duct tape to his mouth and his nose and started to torture him even more. However, the gang soon realized that the victim was not responding and that he had died, presumably because he could not breathe. So then they decided to cut his arms off, cut his hands off, cut his feet off. They decapitated him. They taped his head um, like a soccer ball and started kicking it around. And it was at this point where they took out the stomach, they took out the intestines, and legend has it, they consumed parts of the body. They then disposed of the body in different locations. Now when the case went to trial, most of it was sealed off from the public. Because of the satanic gruesome nature of it, the police felt like it was too explicit to be reported on. They didn't want the influence of satanism to influence other people. And in August of 1999, Jarno was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Terry Pavashonka received a sentence of eight years and she was found partially insane at the time. She was released in 2003, but her story does not end there. You see, in 2007, she murdered someone else, which was a, a drug feud, so to speak. So she was sentenced to prison again. In 2011, she escaped from that prison, but then she was caught. But then guess what? In 2017, she was released. Like Finland, what the hell is wrong with your sentences? As for Jarno himself, he was granted parole and released in 2016. And as of then, it seems he's working a stable job and hasn't gotten into any trouble. Now to conclude on the Jarno story, I don't think this is about Satanism or religion or anything of that nature. I just think this was a kid who was pissed off. If you're continuously drinking all the time, you're looking to escape. Nothing wrong with alcohol, but if you're drinking all the time, you are escaping from something. He was running from himself. It may have been the abuse as a kid. It may have been, maybe he never really tackled that. I don't know. But he was certainly running from something. And he used Satanism as a way to justify his cruel action in his mind. He wanted to hurt others. He wanted to let go of his anger. And he used Satanism as a vehicle to do that. But the problem wasn't his religious beliefs. The problem wasn't what Satanism supposedly believes. The problem was that he never accepted what happened to him. Which in a sense I can understand because, you know, abuse is, well, I mean, you can't quantify that into words. 
Either way, we can all agree he should never have been released in prison. Again, Finland, what the fuck is wrong with you? So why don't you guys comment, tell me what you think of both cases. Thank you for watching.